My name is Benjamin Von Wong. I'm an artist, I'm an activist, and I create work that looks something like this. The purpose behind the work that I create is to ignite in people a sense of curiosity. I want people to look at this and wonder, what am I looking at? Because curiosity leads to conversation, and if there's one thing we need more of, it's exactly that, more conversation. So when someone asks me, what am I looking at, I get to say, oh, this is actually a photograph. It's a photograph of an art installation that I built. There's a guy jumping in the middle of it. And we built this inside of a mall in Vietnam over the course of a couple of weeks with the help of dozens and dozens of volunteers that came together because each and every one of my projects is an opportunity to engage community. Um, and those little lines that you see that make up the entire art installation, well, those are straws, single-use plastic straws, 168,000 of them, in fact, that we collected, cleaned, and organized over the course of nine months in order to create a Guinness World Record art installation. Now, the purpose behind this art installation is to show how small little individual actions add up, and it's taking something that's ordinarily very boring and making it into something that you cannot ignore. That's sort of what I try to do with each and every one of my projects. They don't only revolve around a single material, they try to expand across different categories. If we take something like biochar, which is responsible for 89% of verified carbon removal credits, it's something that most people don't understand. So how do you get people to care? I think art is a really interesting way of igniting those conversations. So if biochar is created through fire, through a process called pyrolysis, where you take organic material, pyrolyze it so that it can be crumbled, sequestered into the ground to heal the soil and rehabilitate the soil, why not create a phoenix that is six and a half meters tall, made out of four tons of carbon, which is the average carbon footprint of the average person every single year? Now, it's not only about creating things that are visible. Sometimes we end up with challenges to highlight issues that are a little bit less visible. I was commissioned by Greenpeace to create this art installation. They wanted me to talk, uh, come up with a symbol that could highlight the environmental impacts of Bitcoin mining. I found some stories online about how old coal-fired power plants were being reopened so that Bitcoin mining rigs could run. And I was like, oh, why not integrate all of these elements together to create a really cool art installation? But it isn't just about the art. It's how that art can later be used. It can be used to communicate, be communicated on the front of reports, for merchandising, to engage people, or even be remixed across different mediums so that it can be projected on the side of a skyscraper all the way in New York. Now, I started off my life as a hard rock mining engineer. Uh, didn't really have any background in art. But I learned really early on as I, was, as I quit my day job and I was trying to figure out how to make a career as an artist that the only way to survive is by attracting attention. You have to make people care about whatever it is that you're doing. Earlier in my career as an artist, it was all about doing stunts. I would come up with these crazy ideas, like tying models 30 meters underwater in a shipwreck in Bali while I was on vacation with my parents. It just sounded like a cool idea. But at the time when I was creating these images, there was no bigger driver or motivation behind it than likes and clicks, right? The whole thing was just going from one stunt to another. What happens if I took superheroes and put them on the edge of a 40-story skyscraper, or perhaps going to the world's largest monastic library and recreating a real world Beauty and the Beast. These, this was what I was spending the earlier part of my career doing, fantasy, just to engage people. But somewhere along the way, I decided that I needed to find a little bit more purpose, something deeper. And thankfully for us, there are a lot of issues in the world that need solving. Um, and so as I started watching a lot more documentaries, seeing all the information that was out there, but I had intentionally looked the other way because it was inconvenient, I started discovering all sorts of different issues. I'll just focus on one that I've paid a lot of attention to, and that's plastics. Way back in 2016, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch had just been discovered, and my mom had just also found around the same time a mermaid tail designer, and I, thought, I was like, oh, mermaids. If mermaids were real and they lived in the ocean, they would have a lot of problems. So we came up with this campaign idea to create Mermaids Hate Plastic. We put 10, 000, uh, a mermaid on 10,000 plastic bottles to highlight this idea um, of how threatened our ecosystems are. And I find it so funny that for some reason, if this had been an ordinary person lying on 10,000 plastic bottles, I think it would actually be less impactful than if we had a mermaid. Because this is sort of digging into our childhood memories. It's a, a common symbol that, a, uh, that exists across narratives. And somehow, we sometimes need the fiction to make the truth more palatable. And the success of these projects uh, really gave me a sense of hope and possibility. I was like, oh, me as an artist, I can actually contribute to this issue. There is a place for this kind of work because we can raise awareness, we can create conversations around this. People are looking for it. And so I started diving deeper into the issue, learning more about the different aspects of the plastic pollution crisis. There are some issues like this one that are just 
really interesting, but that just don't appeal to the masses. We just heard from the last panel about fashion. So textile industry, 75% of the textile industry comes from fossil fuels. It's polyester, nylon, spandex, it's all synthetic. So what happens when you put it in the laundry machine? It releases microfibers back out into the water, into our food chain, into our bodies. But how do you translate that? Once again, the power of art through metaphors is a really great way of making this issue a little bit more interesting so that you can talk to your friends, your kids, your families, right? Same idea. The science is still backing it. It works hand in hand. But I think it's just as important of a piece of that puzzle. Along the way, I would stumble across different statistics. Um, at the time, 2018, I think, every 60 seconds, a truckload of plastic flows into the ocean. But what does the truckload of plastic look like? And what would it be like if we threw it into the ocean? So we took all this plastic, tied it together, threw it into the ocean, and through the videos and stories that we would tell, we would share how difficult it was to even keep those plastics that were tied up under control. And now, fast forward to today, the statistics only get worse. Every 60 seconds, two truckload of plastics flow into the ocean. And as I went around the world doing all of these different projects around plastic pollution, you know, one thing was certain, it was that plastics was easier and easier to find. I could find it anywhere in the world as quickly as you needed it. I mean, I found 18,000 plastic cups in a single day in Singapore for this project. But the other half, the half of hope, is that with every project that I would do, I would equally find dozens, if not hundreds, of volunteers that would come out to help because they wanted to contribute to making sure that this message was getting out there and that people would hear the message. But one thing started to dawn on me as I started doing this work, and that is that no matter how much awareness we're raising, we weren't necessarily getting to the root cause of plastic pollution. Because no matter what level of recycling we might do or cleanups, we're not actually making a dent in plastic production. And when we project this all the way out to the future, it gets even worse. Single-use plastic, or just plastic production as a whole, is expected to triple by 2050, 2060. And so with that in mind, I started wondering, where does the work need to exist if we're at a restrain and constrain plastic production, there's only one place. That's when you start talking at the regulatory level. And so I eventually found myself in Nairobi, Kenya, this time around trying to collect three tons of plastics from the local slums in Kibera. We hired hundreds of local ladies to help us clean, organize, sort, tie these plastics together. And after, uh, after a week of hard work, this was after we had fundraised to build this art installation, the whole goal, the hope, was that we could get this art installation on the grounds of the United Nations. And at 5 p.m. on a Friday night, we managed to somehow get permission for an 8 a.m. installation to build this giant four-story tall plastic tap spewing plastics all over the environment. Why? Because I knew that every single day for an entire week, 1,500 delegates from 193 different countries are gonna walk past this art installation and be reminded why it was necessary for us to have a global plastic treaty. And after a week of negotiations, they ended up signing what was probably the most ambitious environmental treaty into existence that is still being worked on today. But at the time, it just felt like we had really achieved something. Now, I can't say that this art installation created the treaty. I wouldn't be so um, audacious to say something like that. But there is something magical about seeing the entire world rally around a single icon, a single symbol something that everyone could agree upon, no matter how ambitious or not ambitious they were about the plastic pollution problem. For profit, nonprofits, government organizations are like all coming together. So much so that at the end of the day, when the United Nations released their, environmental, their plastics report, they used my art on the cover of it, talking about how important it was to turn off the plastic tap. And it isn't even just about organizations like the UN convening these, you even have countries like the United States, which is one of the least ambitious countries when it comes to plastic pollution controls, using it on the cover of their US State Department website. It's kind of wild. And this experience led me to like one big question that I've been really sitting on and marinating on that I wanted to share with you guys today. That question is, why are there no, not more environmental monuments in the world? Why don't we see, we have all these ambitious treaties, all these ambitious goals, but we have no monuments to hold us accountable to them. And just so we're all on the same page on like what the definition of a monument is, a monument is a statue, building, or other structure erected to commemorate a famous or notable person or event. These are notable and important events of us coming together, setting ambitious global goals, 
And yet there's not one common thing that we have. All we have are lots of photos of people in suits shaking hands. So when I think about monuments, what do I think about? I think of this one, the Statue of Liberty, right? The symbol of freedom and democracy for all people. And I think of how valuable it is to us in this world. It's priceless. And why is it priceless? It's priceless because it embodies something bigger than ourselves. It's priceless because it gets recreated all around the world in different ways to continue telling a story that needs to be told, it can be replicated because it's an idea that can be replicated. We are talking about replicability earlier. Similarly, it serves as a, a beacon to remind us of, of, of this aspirational thing that we're setting out to so that when we fail at it, we can protest about it, right? I think of the Statue of Liberty when it was first commissioned and created, it was freedom and liberty for only white people. What about the women? What about the people of color? And so you could remind the world of why, why this thing was erected, what was trying to say in its original inception. And along the way, when we fail at this time and time again in the, in the present world, it gets picked up by the different storytellers that are out there because there is one common symbol, one common language that we can distill things down to, to a simple and understandable way. So I think that there's, it's just kind of baffling to me that we don't think about monuments at all. And so when I was digging back, I was like, well, okay, how did the Statue of Liberty do it? What's the story there? Well, it turns out the Statue of Liberty is also something that nobody asked for, nobody wanted. It came from the French, and it took 21 years to bring it to life. Most of that time was just spent fundraising and convincing people that this idea that had never been done before was possible. And the guy who built this only figured out the internal engineerings like three years before it was actually built. It's absolutely crazy. And it was so hard for him to fundraise, in fact, that the, the Statue of Liberty ended up in, in boxes, in parts, in New York City, a full year before it was actually ready to be installed because they had so much problems raising funds for the pedestal itself. And yet, it stands today as something that is so necessary, so quintessential to modern day society and what we're hoping to bring forth, the best version of ourselves. And so I think these days about the kind of work that I'm hoping to do and where it's gonna go from here. And I think of all these different conferences that are going on in the world where we have world leaders coming together to talk about really important things. So this year in October, we have 196 countries coming together to talk about how they're going to protect 30% of the world by 2030. What does that look like? What does that feel like? How are we going to commemorate that? At the moment, there's no plan. No one's asking for it. And so I've been fundraising to get this piece out there. And the idea that I have is something that looks like this, a biodiversity Jenga. A fairly simple concept, the idea of interconnected systems, except it's on the verge of collapse. What happens is each and every one of these blocks represent a unique and ecosystem, different ecosystem. What if we could get students from all around the world to build little animals that we could add into the whole thing? What if this is something that could greet each and every person that was coming in to negotiate the treaty, not only for the sake of the treaty itself, but for years to come? I think there's tremendous value in that. I don't know what the dollar value is. I don't know what the return on investment is, but maybe the return on imagination is far greater. And so there's one quote that I'd like to end on. That is this, it is better to see something once than to hear about it a thousand times. I think there's so much value in simplifying such complexity, all this white paper talk that we've been having, to something that is actually easily digestible and communicable out to the masses. And if this is something that you guys want to explore, I would love to hear from you, whether you're on the distribution side, on the fundraising side, or on the impact side. I would love to co-create with you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>